got a friend, he was a high school friend, who uh, grew up in Singapore, and then there's folks came to Seattle uh, for kids to go to high school. He went back as a missionary. He just posted this on uh, Facebook, General Pauline letter outline. Grace, I thank God for you. Hold fast to the gospel. And for the love of everything holy, don't do anything stupid. Timothy says hi. <laughs> kind of wraps it up. And so, so every once in a while, um, we break up the ser- series and do so with what we call just a, a pastor's choice, preacher's choice. And, and that comes about after we talk a little bit about what's, what's going on, what are we concerned about in the body. And um, one of the things that I always have great concern about is prayer. And so we're going to take some time today and work through some passages about prayer. Prayer is one of those enigmas. At least it has been in my life, and I think I'm kind of normal. Um, when we talk about prayer, some of you are all, already feel guilty. I don't pray enough. Or, you know, you're trying to count up all the minutes that you could count prayer this week. And we've got this notion in our head that prayer is this glorified, formalized, don't know if I can do it well. And it's none of those things. The truth of the matter is that it's just conversation. That's all it is. I would imagine everybody in this room has had a really good relationship somewhere in life. Parents to kids, best friends, hopefully a friendship that moved into a relationship that was significant throughout life. I think of some of the guys I went to college with and the depth of relationship there. I think of the woman that I met in college and the depth of relationship there. She said today, she said, uh, you want me to sit through both services? I said, man, after this many years, I'm thrilled that you want to go to one. <laughs> but how did those relationships happen? Was it just sitting across coffee shop? Was it just playing ball? How did they happen? They happened through words. Sometimes they were deep words. Sometimes they were silly words. Sometimes they were sarcastic if you're a guy. Sometimes they were tender and caring if you're a girl. I mean, it just, all kinds of things happened, and it was all conveyed through words. And that's what prayer is. It's the building of a relationship with one who loves you. And we're going to talk about that phrase right there for a few minutes before we can get to prayer, especially biblical prayer. It's a conversation with the one who loves you. It's, it's important that we understand God loves us. God loves you. God loves me. And, and the importance of it is, is so critical that it's woven throughout the Bible without necessarily being this billboard in front of us, although we've made it a billboard sometimes. But prayer and this relationship with God is just meant to be part of the fabric of what it means to have relationship with God. This love provides for the relationship with God. And yet, how many of you played sports? Yeah. What was Mondays? It was drill day. What did you drill? All the new fancy things? No. It was back to basics. And the teams that got the basics down the best were the teams that won. The teams that had the endurance. The teams that had the resilience to that pain that the coach promised you every Monday. And by game day, it was okay. We could do those things without thinking. That's what prayer is meant to be. It's not meant to be, oh, I got to get my hour in. Oh, I haven't prayed about that yet. No, it's meant to be the casual conversation with the one who loves you the most. God. 
And when we come to it at that basis, we say, okay, I can do this. Jesus, in the, prayer, in the verse that's become the end zone verse, we've trivialized it. We, one of the first verses we memorized, for God so loved the world. And these are Jesus' words. He wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Now, that was the culmination of something. Many of you have read the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is the story of God pursuing the Israelites. And often we focus on the Israelites and what terrible creatures they were, created by God, blessed by God, called by God, and still they rejected him. And it's there because we too are the terrible creatures. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is the God who pursued them. The point of the story is God pursued them to the point of exasperation where he says, okay, we'll do it differently and I'll send Christ. I'll send Jesus. I'll send my son to die for you. So the choice is just up to you. I'll take away the need for the sacrifice. I'll take away the need for the temple. I'll provide the sacrifice. The temple would be you. You just need to choose to love him. And then he did something even more miraculous. He rose Christ from the dead, proving that he was Lord not over just nature, but over evil. And that's the simple verse that's on the screen. God loved you so much that he died for you. Then there's the question, do we believe it? And this question is so important to prayer. Do we believe that there's somebody actually on the other side of the line? Do we believe that when I pray, The great big God of the universe actually hears me. Because if we believed that, our prayers might be different. There might actually be power in them. There would definitely be attention given to them. And Jesus then takes us to the other side of the coin. And he says, God loves you, but you need to love him. And he describes how we're supposed to love him as was given to the Israelites, and he restates it to us today. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Kind of wraps it up. There's not much left. So a few weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, Nick says, Just love God and then do what you want. Why? Because if you're loving God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what you're going to do is going to be pleasing him because your entire motivation is wrapped up in the Father. And that's so critical to how we pray. Throughout the Old Testament... And then in James, there's a word that's used that makes us startle. It makes us feel shame. And it's one of those shames that some people say, well, there's there's nothing good that can come out of shame. If it's motivating to the right thing, sometimes good can come out of shame. Let me illustrate before we go to the word. If you have that relationship I described a minute ago, whether it's your best friend or a spouse, it's elevated because of loyalty. It's elevated because of the security that relationship brings you. It's elevated because of the trust that's been put into it. And then one day, it's broken. And the same word that was, the same emotion that was labeled as love swings 180 degrees to hate. We feel betrayed. 
and it hurts to the depths of our soul. Let me candid, candidly illustrate it this way. Hi, honey, I'm home. Well, where have you been? Oh, I was with another woman, but it wasn't very satisfying, so I came home. The feeling even now in just that illustration is anger. But that's to the depth that God pursues us, loves us, and wants us. And James in chapter 4 says this, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on passions, literally your pleasures. And then he calls us, the church, adulterers. How? Why? One of the themes that Nick has preached consistently, at least over the seven years that I've been here, is that the world will snatch everything you can give it away. We have to crucify the flesh and pursue God. It's interesting, we live in the culture around us. It's music, it's art, it's commercialization, it's um, everything that's out there. We don't have to choose it, it just pours into us because we're porous people. We take in and, and respond to our environment. To be a Christian takes discipline. To be a Christian, you have to choose. To be a sinner, you just have to be. There's no work involved at all. It just happens. And it's so easy to take what the world offers in lieu of what God has provided. And James uses this word to illustrate. God loves you to such a degree that any time you pursue worldliness in front of him, you earn the title of adulterer in God's eyes. Now, the cool thing is about God is he doesn't change. 2 Timothy 3.13 says that he is faithful because he simply can't do anything else. He is faithful. Why is it so easy to repent to God? Because he's not vengeful. God is always about redemption. So any sin I can bring to him, I know with confidence is going to be received as long as my heart is repentant with a you're forgiven. And all of a sudden that word is let go and we're in right standing with God. I just thought through in my own life and this over the summer. Shoot, I didn't have to go back past Monday. Where were the moments I chose the world instead of God without giving God credit for the creation he let me enjoy? See, God doesn't despise your good things. Psalm 19, he says he wants you to have pleasures. He gives you pleasures. All of creation is for your pleasure. It's for your good. He does not not want you to have good things. He does not want you to have those good things in lieu of him. He's jealous. Well, isn't jealousy bad? No, not always. He's jealous for you in a very healthy, right way because he wants you to have the very best, and the very best he can give you is himself. The best he can give you is his forgiveness, his peace, his joy, his confidence in, in the relationship, the security, the protection, the provision. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on that God wants to give us. And yet, how many times have we, oh, I haven't prayed about this yet. Well, what have we been doing? Honestly, we've been hedging the bet just in case God doesn't come through. Now, we learned that at a very early age. 
We call it the terrible twos as an excuse. But what's really going on there? We're learning boundaries. We're learning boundaries and we're learning authority. Not just so we always do it right, but we're also learning how to get around it. Anybody here parents of twos? Proof, there's a sin nature. That's all the theology you need. The problem is we grow up and we perfect that trait. We would rather live with a dotted white line than a double striped yellow because we want to find the ways that we can be in control. We want to find the ways that we can manipulate the authority for our good. Have you ever listened to your prayers? Not just prayed them, but listened to them. What are you praying for? How are you praying? Can you back that prayer up in the Bible? Can you back that prayer up with God's word, with his intent for you? Is it missional? Or is it you need a parking place? No, you don't. You need the exercise. We pray for the trivial things that I'm sure God just is like, seriously? We got people going to hell and you're asking me for that? You don't even know your neighbor's name and you want a new car? A pink one? (laughs) And we find out that, at least I have found out, that I'm pretty selfish. And I don't take into account the goodness of God in just the everyday life that he gives me. God has invited us into this crazy good life, and we look over our shoulder just to see what we might be missing. What would that do to your wife, to your husband, to your best friend? Not even to say to God. It's sobering. He goes on to the next chapter in James 5. He says, the prayer of a righteous man, or the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. What's it mean to be a righteous person? Don't read perfect. We're not. But we're made perfect in Christ Jesus. He's our perfection. We're in the process of becoming But as long as we're looking towards God, we're good. As long as he is our primary and everything else is secondary, life is good. We don't fall into James' rage. We don't fall into the name calling because our heart is towards God. And if our heart is towards God, we're made perfect in him and we're okay. Our prayers are okay because we're loving him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's amazing how all of the Bible rolls together to the same story. God is God and we are not, and he loves us and elevates us up to share his glory. It's amazing. But along the way, it's difficult because the world is so enticing, and we live there. Now, there's another verse says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And that's usually all we memorize, right? We love formulas, and if that were the formula, we'd be in. I want, oh yeah, in Jesus' name. That's not what it says. The period's not after in Jesus' name. It's a comma. The proof text is that the Father is glorified. Even in John 17, the priestly prayer, Jesus is saying, I am glorified so that the Father is glorified. Everything that Jesus was about brought glory to the Father. And I've had to learn over the years to sometimes 
take back my prayers and say, you know, let me, let me amend that. That one was selfish. Let me restate it so that you get the glory, not Mike. And it's amazing that when I do that, they get answered. It's funny how that works. But it's just simply what it says. When our prayers are in accordance with God and his will and his intention and are redemptive, it seems that they get answered. Because we're praying into the mission of God. We're praying by the name of King Jesus who leads that mission. To pray in somebody's name, I think I've used this story before, but Gary, a friend of mine, when I was at Graham, was, we were talking to the ambassador of France. We said, tell him, is your job description? He said, that's easy. It's a one-liner. I say what the president says. And we're like, that's it? You get this great house and travel and everything, and that's it? He says, yeah, I have an opinion in my office, but that's about it. Not that I don't always hold to that, but that's from the job description. Second uh, Corinthians 17 calls us ambassadors of the kingdom of God. People who are sent, people who exist, people that live in Madison and across this world to say what Jesus says to represent the heart and the intent of the kingdom of God. That's us. That's you. That's me. And there are times I have to be so careful because I want to respond to somebody in the flesh, and I can't. I'm supposed to respond in the spirit, in God's spirit. And so to speak in the name of Jesus prayerfully means I have to know what his intention is. I have to read this. I have to understand what the Bible is about. I have to understand the heart of God. I understand his love for me and my love for him. Because if I understand those two things, the heart of God for me and my heart for him, my prayers will get answered because they're according to the name of Jesus and the Father will be glorified. When John or Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, she's talking from a historical and a present perspective about where the Samaritans worship and where the Jews worship. And Jesus always had these crazy things to say. He said, well, there'll come a time when you have to worship in spirit and truth. And she's like, yeah, sure. What was he talking about? Why was he referencing worship and prayer in the terms of spirit and truth? The the spirit part wasn't our spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. When we worship, when we pray, who calls us to the throne of God? The Holy Spirit does. We can follow that same thought all the way back. How did we get saved? Well, we always say, well, through Jesus and the cross. Yes, but who called us there? Who convicted us? Who who brought us? Who made him aware to our minds? The Holy Spirit did. He prompts us in prayer. I'm sure all of you have had those moments where all of a sudden some person's name or mind or face pops into your mind and you're like, well, that's weird. No, that's usually the Holy Spirit. That's when you want to pause and pray for that person right then and there. It doesn't have to be long, lengthy. It just needs to be, okay, God, I'm going to lift them up because you just prompted me to pray for them. See, because God's doing something in his kingdom in that person's life. And for some odd reason, he's called us to participate in that. And so we have to be aware of the Spirit's work in us. Now, we can't be aware of the Spirit's work in us if we're out playing in the world and looking at the world's ways. We can only be aware of the Spirit if we're loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
because then the lines are clean, the station's tuned in, we hear the Spirit's voice, we understand the nudging, and we can respond in obedience. And then the truth is God's word. We have to pray according to God's word. I had a young pastor in our living room on a Saturday morning, and he's going through some really difficult times. And he had called and said, can I come over so you and Estel can pray for me? He said, you can come over. He got there and he said, will you pray for me? And I said, no. But we'll agree with you because you need to pray this prayer. I don't need deliverance from this. You do. So pray. He began to pray. And about 40 seconds into his prayer, I said, stop. He kind of looked at me like, I'm praying. I said, no, you're not. You're talking. Guy had an MDiv. He understood the Bible. I said, is what you're praying biblical? He said, I've never thought about that. So we'll think. Is what you're praying biblical? He said, no. It's selfish. I said, okay, now we get that figured out, start over. And we had the most amazing moments of, of deliverance and ministry because all of a sudden he was praying truth, prompted and guided by the Holy Spirit in his life, and the freedom that God promises was given. Why should that be a surprise? Just the very few verses we've read about prayer open the door to that. How we pray depends on the posture of our heart. How we pray depends on what we have fed into this mind of ours. How we pray is dependent upon what we love, what we strive for what we want to achieve. And if those things are in line with Scripture, then our prayers are answered because God hears them, because he loves you, because he cares for you, because he wants you to have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Christianity is not to be this sour-faced religion. It's supposed to be marked by joy. But I'll tell you what, when you try to live Christianity in the flesh, it's horrid. Because we can't do it. And we are so frustrated. And I've heard so many people say, it just doesn't work for me. No, you're not working for it. You haven't truly loved God. You haven't truly given yourself fully to the king. Or it would work. Because it's how God created us to be. I wish that Philippians 4, 5, and 6 were written, not written, punctuated a little bit different. See, there's a period after the Lord is at hand. And then the next verse starts up in the middle of the sentence and says, be anxious for nothing. I think it better reads, the Lord is at hand, be anxious for nothing. If the Lord's at hand, I don't have to be anxious for anything. God is present. Who's bigger than him? When I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and recognize that he loves me and he is on the other side of this line. There's nothing in life that's bigger than the one that is present. And it changes my prayers. See, I don't have to beg for what already is at hand. I don't have to pray for protection if I'm standing in Christ Jesus. I don't have to pray for most of the things that I find myself praying about 
if I'm confident in his presence. Because the promises are true. If he's present, there's no anxiety. He's faithful. And when I find myself out of that, I can quickly do what David demonstrates in Psalms 51, and that's get on my knees and repent. And the relationship is right and secure. And God loves us in that position where we are recognizing his lordship, who he is. And it brings us back to Jesus. Pray it in my name. Pray in a way that the Lord is, is that the God, that, excuse me, that the Father God is glorified. And I'll, I'll do it. Now, timing may be an issue. We tend to want it all right now. Sometimes he knows that's not necessarily best for us, so he waits. But he does answer. Piper said this, prayer was meant to be and is the communication means for the battlefield, not a household intercom for our comfort. I think it's a pretty good statement. We sang this morning with great gusto, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we are invited to pray into that. We are invited to participate in that. We're invited to understand Ephesians 6 that says, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but the princes and palaces of the air of evil. And we can't stand against that. But we don't need to because God did. And God does. We just need to pray into our rightful place in it. We just need to proclaim that victory. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for the myriad of things that we pray for. What I am saying is, Pray for them in the right place. Don't pray for anything that usurps God getting the credit, God getting the glory. Make sure that your prayers are inside of the mission of God. So what can we pray for? Salvations, reconciliations. We can pray for salvations because God's redeeming. We can pray for reconciliations because he's reconciling all things unto him. We can pray for healing. God is compassionate. I was frustrated one day with my pain, and it was a Monday, and we have staff prayer at 1130 on Mondays. And I asked the team, I said, God has shown me some things, and yet I hurt too much to do them and I want to be around to see some of them completed. Pray that God would give me the strength to do that. Nick very quickly said, no, that's not why God heals. He heals because he loves you. He heals because he's compassionate. He doesn't heal so you can be productive. He can get it done without you. We pray for knowledge and wisdom because it's the obedient thing to do. Because he wants the Holy Spirit to engage our minds and our spirits pre-intellect in such a way that we come up with the things that God wants said in this world. With the creative aspects that we can bring to business, to life, to the arts. It saddens me that the universities and sciences and arts all belong to the church at one point. And we've given them all away. And we need to reclaim them because it's the mind of Christ that's driving us. That's excellence, that's wisdom, that's knowledge beyond the norm. And we need to exercise it and he wants to freely give it to us. If we're loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Not perfectly, but at least towards him. We can pray for our needs. Jesus demonstrated that 
we actually got a line on our knees in the Lord's Prayer. After God, God was honored, after we recognize who he is and what his position is, to recognizing that the battle is his, God takes care of our needs. The problem is we've turned our wants into our needs. He wants you to be taken care of. He doesn't want to be usurped. He doesn't want to feel the pangs of adultery. Instead, he joyously wants to respond to you because he loves you. He wants to answer your prayers. He wants to give you better than the world can give you. And as long as we pray in alignment with God and his intentions, our prayers are answered. So there's plenty to pray about. In Ephesians, it says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And somehow Jesus always slips in that little caveat, as the Father will be glorified or in the Spirit, because it's his kingdom, and we are his children. It's good. He gives us what we need as we need it. One morning, I, I had an appointment and um, this appointment was going to determine for, for that moment in time at least whether or not this person was gonna follow Christ. It was kind of a pivotal decision. And I got up about 5.30, quarter to six, and I'm sitting in the closet getting dressed, the door shut so that the light wouldn't be in Estelle's eyes, she was still sleeping. And I looked up and my vision was cloudy from here, from about 1.30, one this way. It was like looking through a crinkled piece of uh, cellophane. And it scared me. I said, Estel, anytime I call that out, she has one response. She didn't even have to be awake to do it. She just begins to pray. She comes in the door. Estel's not a morning person. Not until she gets her IV coffee. And uh, she begins to, she said, what's wrong? And I started to tell her, and she just went on ahead and prayed without me informing her of how she should pray. Thought it was kind of rude. <laughs> and she prayed for that appointment. I'm sitting there thinking, my eye, my brain is going haywire. I don't even care if I get to the appointment. And she gets done, and she says this. Can you see any better? I looked up, and I could see kind of about 3 o'clock, but over here was still crinkly. So she prays the same prayer again. I'm like, woman. <laughs> she gets done. Can you see? Yeah. She went back to bed. <laughs> Never did ask me how I was doing. Because it wasn't about me. There was a battle going on for that person's soul that I got caught in, and God prayed according to God's intentions, or Jesus, Esther prayed according to God's intentions. He answered. The battle was won and went on, and that person gave their life fully and completely to Jesus that day and is living for him. And if it had been up to me in that moment, I'd have probably rescheduled and gone to the doctor. But in the spirit, she was praying and she prayed truth. And God answered the prayer and did something not even connected to me. I just simply got caught in the crosshairs. And fortunately, one of us was listening to the Father that day. And I learned a valuable lesson about prayer. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. 
There's a phrase you've heard around here. It's pray the prayer that Jesus would pray for you. That's the safest prayer that you can pray. What does God want for you? What would Jesus pray for you? Because if it's Jesus, the perfect one, God's going to answer it because he's faithful to his own. So pray into the mission of God and then enjoy life. Pray into the mission of God. And that includes everything in your life. Because he wants you to have life abundantly. Filled with joy, but fully aware. Not caught in the snares of the world. But protected and loved by the Father himself. Father, I am humbled just standing here this morning realizing how I have violated these very words this week. Father, you are so good. Your love is so complete. You have made it so easy to love you with everything we are. And yet I have to ask for forgiveness because I let life and the things in life get ahead of you. Forgive me. Forgive us. And Father, that we would take what we've heard this morning and sort it out and take what we need to take what we don't need to take, let it just lay on the floor. But help us to be better communicators to you about the things that you care about. Because when we are intimate and vulnerable with you, it's always for our betterment. And it's always for your glory. We love you, Father. I'm amazed that your love for us over and over again you pursue us when we've disappointed you. And from the very beginning words of Genesis 3 you have pursued us in a rebellious nature. Thank you. May we be honoring to you as a church in Jesus' name. Amen.